what does it mean to be a CISO? Because what I'm realizing is a lot of the blocking and tackling and typical things that come up, people are often ignoring or not doing, and a lot of those fundamentals we tend to forget about. And then let's face it, most CISOs, not all, most CISOs, most of our listeners, come from a cyber security background. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, 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 my friends. I hope you know what time it is. It's time for Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. E Dog is in the house. Hope you are doing awesome. Hope you are living the most amazing life possible. And most importantly, you are being world class, right? Because that's what we're about here, taking it to the next level. So, what I really want to cover on this episode is a topic that's been coming up a lot, which is sort of what does it mean to be a CISO? Because what I'm realizing is, a lot of the blocking and tackling and typical things that come up, people are often ignoring or not doing, and a lot of those fundamentals we tend to forget about. And then let's face it, most CISOs, not all, most CISOs, most of our listeners, come from a cyber security background. That's what we know, that's what we love, that's what we've done for three, five, eight, 10, 12 years. So the problem is when the pressure comes on and we start getting uncomfortable or frustrated, we tend to go back to what we know and what we're comfortable with, which is techie and geek, which actually is the worst possible solution to the problem. Because most likely, the challenges you're having being a CISO or trying to become a CISO or getting your first job as a CISO or switching jobs to be a CISO at a new company are all around you not embracing and knowing the business. When I talk to executives and CEOs and COOs and board of directors about CISOs and security folks, it's always the same thing. Eric, they are too technical. They're not embracing and understanding the role. They're not speaking business. They don't understand the business. They're not helping us grow and expand the business. They're trying to spend money and decrease revenue and profitability. Biggest complaints of executives is CISOs want to limit functionality. They keep telling us no. They keep saying we can't do it. They keep saying that they need more money. They keep saying they need more resources. And the executives go, Eric, do they understand we're running a business and they're a chief officer, and they're supposed to be helping us grow and expand. The business not be the bottleneck, not tell directors they can't do things, and then directors come to us and say, oh, the reason why the launch of our new product or the launch of our new e-commerce site that was gonna bring in $30 million worth of revenue is delayed is because security wouldn't allow us to do it. Do you really think that's going to go over well with the executive teams. So let's just go ahead and start reviewing some fundamentals, blocking and tackling. First, 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 first rule you must never ever forget as a CISO and really a security professional. If you negatively impact the business, you are wrong. Now at this point, I know some hardcore security folks that listen to this webinar basically just just birded me off and basically said, Eric, that is so off. Sometimes businesses must make sacrifices in order to stay secure. Congratulations, you're a world-class security engineer. And if you keep that attitude, that viewpoint, you are going to be an awful CISO because it's not the correct frame. The correct frame, if you are a chief officer, whether you like it or not, 
And the longer it takes you to learn this lesson, the longer it's going to take you to be an effective chief information security officer. But the reality is, if you negatively impact the business, if you cost the business money, you are wrong and you are not going to be an effective executive. Hard pill to swallow. Took me a long time to recognize that. Yes, and I've had people debate me, what about this? What? The point is, if you're a world-class CISO, if you're a world-class chief information security officer, you figure out a way. You figure out a way to do things in a secure way that enables the business, that allows the business to grow and expand, and it absolutely can be done. But you have to get out of this mindset that if something is not secure, it shouldn't be done. Because here's the reality. If there's an e-commerce site that's rolling out, let's even say it has some vulnerabilities, it is not 100%, maybe it's 70 or 80% chance it'll get hacked. But if you say no, if you kill the project and say no, it cannot launch, how much money does the company make? But if you launch it and it gets hacked in six, nine, or 12 months, still made 20 or 30 mil. Now, yes, maybe it costs you a mil because of the breach, but, but you see the point. So you got to let the money flow. You have to let money flow. And the way you become world-class is that creativity. What I'm known for with executives and others, and I get called, I just got called this morning, is if companies are calling me, it's one of two reasons. Either they have a problem that no one else can solve, which is usually what I hope it is, or the you-know-what has hit the fan and they, they have no other option. Right? I, I, I always joke, I'm never the first person that they call, but I'm always the last because right? I always fix or solve that problem. But I often get calls where it's like, Eric, we need to do this, but no one can tell us how to do it in a secure manner. And I'll always will. I'll always figure out and find a way. That's what I love about security and being in this role is the creativity. So tap in to your creative genius. Tap into your creativity. And that's going to take you to the world class status. So first and foremost, being a CISO, you must always be a business enabler. If you negatively impact the business, you are wrong, period, end of subject, no longer discussion. Tied to that. Second important, when I was in the CIA, <coughs> this was back <coughs> in the early 90s, I remember when I was trained on being a security officer, older gentleman took me and he goes, son, let me tell you how it's done around here. He goes, you're going to get a lot of security training and in the beginning you're not going to know what you're doing. That's cool because we're going to send you the meetings and they're going to propose things, and it really doesn't matter what they propose. It really doesn't matter what they say. And they're going to go around the room because they need to get approval from all these different departments. And when they come to you, no matter what it is, look at your notes, do a little, mm, maybe a little, mm, maybe a little, mm, right? Uh, make it look like you really thick it, and then go, no, nope, can't do it. Because the reality is this. Any system that anyone comes up with has vulnerabilities, has issues, and no matter what it is, we just always say no out of the gate because the reality is most of the ideas are never going to see the light of day. So why should we invest a lot of time, energy, and effort in it? And most of the projects get killed. So just say no. So everybody knew the security person was there to say no. It became pretty evident. And then he goes, if they have a second meeting, if they're elevating this and they really want to do this, probably have a second meeting this time, you have to take even more. And this time you have to even give more of the, right? Maybe a little growl, right? Really, really giving it some thought. Pause for at least 10 seconds so it really looks like you're being intellectual. And then you say no. And then if it's a third meeting, then involves somebody more senior and then we'll come with you and really evaluate whether they should or should not do it. And unfortunately, for a long time, that's how security was done. The people that say no. And I even run across that a lot today, where I'll go in and I'll run across folks and I go, what do you do for a living? So, oh, 
Oh, you're the cyber guy. You're the one that always makes our life more difficult. You're the one that tells us no. You're the one that says we can't do things. And I'm like, no, do whatever you want. And they're like, really? Sure. My job is not to tell you no. My job is to make sure you're aware. My job is to make sure you're asking the right questions. So the reality is this. A really good CISO trains everyone to ask two questions. The first question, everyone asks. And that first question, by itself, gets more companies into trouble than any other question. And that question is simply this. What is the value or benefit? So somebody's sitting there and comes up with a crazy idea. Crazy. And they go, what's the value or benefit? Well, any crazy idea has value and benefit. So of course they'll come up with value and benefit. Of course they'll come up with ways that's going to make the companies trillions or quadrillions of dollars. Well, if that's the only question you ask, and because every idea, no matter how insane, has benefit and value and revenue, you end up doing a lot of really silly, ridiculous things. And you've seen that with many companies where they'll do things. And, and I'll sit there. I'm not going to mention any. I'm sure you have your favorite. And I'm sitting there going, really? Did a bunch of really smart people actually sit in a boardroom and say, that's a really good idea. I mean, really? Like, who sat there and said, this is a good idea. We should do that. Right? But guess what? They did. Right? So, but it's crazy. It's crazy that some people are going to do because they're only asking one question. And it's funny because I've been on these different boards of people like, oh, people ask the wrong question. I'm like, no, people aren't asking the right question because what is the value and benefit is the right question. They should be asking that. Absolutely, it's not the wrong question. The problem is not that they're asking the wrong question. They're, they're not asking enough questions. Right? Well, one of the, the ones I always love, I, I love little uh, motivational posters or sometimes even joke ones. And one of my favorite is, the next time you think you have a really bad idea, remember somebody went in to a boardroom and pitched the idea of sharks being rained down in a tornado. Right? Sharknado, right? If you haven't seen the <laughs> I mean, really? But somebody actually pitched that idea. Right? So next time when you think you have a bad idea going, Maybe it's not that bad after all, right? Somebody actually went in and pitched that idea for a movie. And to me, that, that's not what boggles my mind. What boggles my mind is they said yes. These top-notch movie executives said yes. That's a good idea. And then, and then, that's not bad enough. Not only did they approve, film, and release Sharknado, but then... Somebody actually came back in and said, we should do a Sharknado too. At that point, they should have locked them up. They should have put them, they needed some help, right? And guess what? They approved it. It's like, oh my. So remember, there's no such thing as bad ideas. Right? Any idea is a good idea. But the point is, not a bad question. What is the value benefit? But they're not asking enough questions. Second question, you must train everybody. What is the risk or exposure? What is the risk or exposure of doing this? So now you go, what is the value and benefit? What is the risk and exposure? And is the value or benefit worth the risk? <coughs> is it worth this risk to do this value or benefit? Now that's used to be. If you listen to older podcasts, that used to be where I would stop and I'd be like, that's what you need to train people on. But what I've learned over the last year or two is there's a third question. And this question is the game changer. This question is the question above all other questions. You then have that executive ask a third question, which is, am I willing to accept that 
risk. <laughs> Drop the mic and walk away. Boom. Because that now shifts it. Because that's what I've learned is I go and I train these executives and they're like, yeah, here's a value and benefit. Yeah, there's a risk and exposure. And yeah, it's worth the risk because guess what? Security is the one that's responsible, not me. Right? So if we do this, yeah, <coughs> it's a risk, but we get hacked, we get broken into, and we pay ransom, and security is going to get fired, not me. But now when you shift it, you shift the model and go, but are you? Are you willing? Right? So have them ask, am I willing to accept that responsibility? Then it changes everything, because now guess what? Now, if that system gets hacked, or you get compromised, you have to pay ransom, you get fired, not the CISO. Hmm. That's the shift. That's the shift that world-class CISOs make. They change the corporate culture from the old culture, which is the business executives have all the authority when it comes to making decisions, but CISO has all the responsibility if they make a bad decision. Now, if you're the executives, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful business model. I do whatever I want and somebody else gets fired. Awesome! But it's not awesome for the company because essentially, really, bad decisions get made and there's no accountability on those who are making the decision. So what world-class CISOs do is they shift the business model. They change it to go, guess what? A CISO is no longer responsible. A CISO is just the advisor on security. Business executives, guess what? You get both. You have the authority and the responsibility. You want to go in and make these decisions, that's awesome. Guess what? If they're outside our tolerated risk, the executives are made aware. So now your name goes on a list of risks that are unacceptable that you decided to accept on behalf of the exec on behalf of the company and you have to explain to the executives why you decided to put the company at risk <laughs> shifts everything so world class CISOs go in and the next key piece they set a risk posture for the organization that the executives buy into this is probably one of the biggest problems and biggest challenges and biggest issues with companies is nobody knows what they can or can't do. So it's really not, I, I sort of go in and, and play it up that like these business executives just do whatever they want and security has the responsibility gets fired. But the reality is they don't know the rules. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't, nobody ever told them. Nobody ever went in and said, listen, this is acceptable, this is not. This is good, this is bad. So we really at some level can't get too mad or blame them because they were never told what Israel is not allowed to do. And guess what? You want a vice president who is hungry to make money. You want a vice president that wants to increase profitability and increase revenue. You want them, when they see these ideas and they see dollar signs and they see zeros, you want them to be the pit bull. You want them to run after it. But if you're not giving them any guardrails, how can you expect them to make good decisions? So we have to do a much, much, much better job of setting the risk posture. What is the risk posture for the organization? What is and what is not acceptable risks? What can and cannot be done? So now they know where they can operate. Okay, if I'm in this realm of risk, we're good. If I go outside this realm, we're not good. And now you're playing by fair rules. And guess what? Now if you go in and say, hey, here's the rules. You understand them. You're trained. If you decide to go outside, color outside the lines, then you're going to go on the list. And that's okay. You can explain it to the executives but they're gonna recognize what are risks that we think are unacceptable and then you can decide why you decided to do it anyway. 
And now when everyone's playing by the same rules, all of a sudden it works really, really well. Now, just to be clear, this is not something that happens overnight, right? These are shifting corporate cultures. They are required and needed for companies to survive in this current day and age. The old mentalities, these old rules, these old ways of playing are not going to work over the next three to five years. Companies that are going to survive and thrive are going to adjust to make these changes. But anytime you make these shifts and changes, it is a little uncomfortable. So you have to recognize and realize that's happening. So now we have that in place. Next key part of being a CISO, being that trusted advisor overseeing the organization, what is it we're protecting? What are the critical assets and the business processes that run on those critical assets? Because if we don't have a prioritized list, if we don't know what our highest and lowest process, how do we know what to protect? How do we know what to secure? Because the reality is you don't protect all assets equally. Some assets need more protection than others. You can't go in and secure everything at the same level. So we need to have a vision or plan of what is it that we're protecting. And it's crazy. I go into companies today and I'm like, okay, what are your critical business process? What are your critical assets? And, and I, I love the answer. They're all important. Okay. Everything goes down. You've lost everything. You have one person, one dollar. What do you bring up first? What do you bring up second? Yeah, half to do the work. You have to put together a list of prioritized assets. Because how else are you going to understand and assess risk? Because remember, everything you do as a CISO is risk-based. That's what cybersecurity is. Understanding, managing, and mitigating risk to your critical assets. So once you know those critical assets, you have to go in and say, what are the threats and what are the vulnerabilities to those critical assets? If you don't know the critical assets, you're generically identifying threats and vulnerabilities, and that doesn't fix anything. Because, great, you're generically addressing these threats, but what if your most critical asset has a major vulnerability that can impact the entire organization, but you're not aware of it? So we have to prioritize and then do risk, and then prioritize those risks across those critical assets. Next, you have to communicate with your executives. You have to make sure your executives understand and know what cybersecurity is. And this is the most critical discussion you have to have. In any practical sense, 100% security doesn't exist. They must understand that. They must own it. They must recognize it. I can't tell you how many times today I go in to talk with companies about helping them implement security and Many, many, not all the time, but many, many times what I hear back is, okay, Eric, we'll hire you, but you have to guarantee we won't get broken into. Or, okay, we'll hire you, but you got to give us bulletproof. You got to make sure that nothing bad will ever happen to the organization. Two problems with that. One is not reality. Two is they're not willing to pay for it. One of the phrases I say all the time is, Everybody wants Bugatti level security, but they want a Honda budget. Nothing wrong with a Honda. If you're not familiar with cars, a Bugatti, depending on which model, I think I think starter Bugatti is maybe 1.8 million, maybe 2.1 million for, for a good solid one. So very expensive car. They want the Bugatti level security, but they don't want to pay for it. You're gonna pay for it, I'll give you the bulletproof, but here's the reality. There is such a thing, and I know, I know at this point, some security engineers that are still listening, even after where I started saying, if it negatively impacts the business, you're wrong, it's going to blow their mind. There is such a thing as overly secure. Such, such a thing exists. If you, and it ties to that first part, if you are paralyzing the organization to the point where nobody can do anything in the organization, that's problematic. There's a balance. So here's the conversation. 100% security can be achieved with zero functionality. Security and functionality are inverse. When you increase one, you decrease the other. So if you get to 100% security, 
you have zero functionality. And that's a paralyzed organization. That is basically you are out of business. So you can't have 100% security because you need functionality. And here's the law of security. Every CISO must know the law of security. Every executive must know the law of security. The law of security is simply this. Whenever you add functionality, you decrease security. Or to put it another way, whenever you add functionality, you increase risk, whichever way you want to put it. But whenever you're adding new functionality to the organization, new services, new processes, whatever it is, you're decreasing security and increasing risk. It is a law, just like any other law. And I love, because some people are like, look, I don't really buy into that. I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm, if I'm going to follow that. Guess what? You don't have to believe in the law of gravity. You can say, I, I don't know about that gravity thing. I'm not, I'm not really into that gravity thing. I don't think it's real. And guess what? You walk off a 10-story building, and gravity will introduce itself to you. So whether <coughs> you believe it or not is sort of irrelevant. It is there, it is at play, and it is always working. So you need to recognize and own the law of security. Every time you're adding functionality, you're decreasing security. And then world-class CISOs, their job is constantly monitoring and analyzing the organization, looking for new risks, and prioritizing those risks and communicating those to executives. And then here's the last and final piece of being a CISO. Open, honest communication. Don't be a hero. This is the biggest one I've seen this year. When I'm doing my group coaching, when I'm doing my one-on-one -on -one coaching, it comes up over and over and over again going, Eric, we keep getting more things put on our plate and we have less and less resources and there's no way we could possibly do everything we are to do. And my question is, why are you saying yes? If I am 100% saturated and you come to me and say, Eric, we need you to do something, I'm going to say, listen, what do you want me not to do? I am 100% saturated. Here is what I'm currently doing. This is taking up all of my time. So you either can go in and reduce the amount of time I put into these and reduce quality, or you can remove something off my plate, but I cannot take on anything else unless you take something off my plate or give me more resources. For some crazy reason, CISOs don't like to say that. They don't like to push back. They don't like to have open, honest conversations. And I sat there in meetings where I know these security groups are overloaded and they're like, can you do this, this, and this? And they're like, sure. I'm like, what's wrong with you? You know you can't do it. You know you're overloaded. You know when you go back to your team, they're going to go nuts on you and you know you're going to come and complain to me. So why in the world did you say yes? It's okay to push back with factual data. So world-class CISOs will continually go back to their executives and say, listen, just want you to know, there are nine high priority things for the organization. Based on the size of the team and the resources we have, we can only do seven. Two of them are not going to get done. There's just no way around it. There's not enough time and resources. So I just want you to agree with these seven, or do you want us to alter or change them? Or do you want to give us more resources and we'll do more things? But a world-class CISO has to be able to communicate and have those conversations because if you keep saying yes, but you can't do the job, it creates stress, frustration, and distrust. Open, honest communication is one of the key skills of being a CISO. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO. I look forward to seeing you next week.